Hello there, I'm Henry Cross, Assistant Teacher at Chorney Boys School. I'm Samir Richards, Associate Senior Leader and Subject Senior Leader for History and Politics. So we're going to be talking to you today about um, our journey uh, as a history department under Samir's leadership um, over the past kind of three to four years. Um, and a big part of the success of the department has been the development of a culture of curriculum, of subject discourse, and to be honest, a real overhaul of where we were three to four years ago to where we are today. And um, I think as a result of that, I think it's fair to say um, there's been lots of uh, positive impacts, such as student engagement, but and that has manifested itself also um, in the results of the students, which have been massively improved. So just starting, I guess, is the uh, what Christine Council pointed out as the problems with this history curriculum. So if you are um, at home watching this now, just uh, have a quick pause, have a think about what are the problems you can see uh, with this curriculum. Okay, great. So the first thing I guess you may have pointed out is the Eurocentric uh, nature of this curriculum. So you, I guess, year seven, you don't really see anything apart from uh, English history. Um, that's again with the year eight British history, uh, include the Atlantic slave trade. Um, and then year nine as well, quite a few GCSE topics you've got in year nine, but they haven't started the GCSE course. So um, quite Eurocentric uh, in its um, entirety, really. Yeah, and I think something else that stands out probably to some of you who are watching this is, is the lack of diversity in the curriculum. Um, like Samir said, it's kind of very, you know, um, very white, European focused. And the only points where you don't have that kind of diverse history or more diverse history rather, you've obviously got the Atlantic slave trade uh, and you've got the civil rights movement in America. Um, but when you think about a student's experience of history, if they were to do year seven, year eight, year nine, and then go on to do GCSE, their only experience, therefore, of black history would be um, kind of portrayed as victims. So, you know, one of um, what we're going to talk to you about a little bit later on is, you know, one of the big changes we made was to include some work on African kingdoms in the medieval period to show that actually, you know, um, looking at Africans in a way in which they are not victims. Yeah, uh, and it's, you know, it's true, we, it's common vernacular says, you know, the history is written by the victors and we know that curriculum is powerful and we've got a real chance here to shape um, students' own uh, self-belief and self-thought about who they are, uh, where they come from. So it, it's really important that we, we show students that, you know, all history is rich um, and it's just poor history if we just do have a history curriculum like this. Um, Ruth Ashby saying schools are students, stewards of knowledge for its for its own sake for all, and it's important that we show that it is truly mm. for all. I think something I'd like just to add on to that this idea of um, you know powerful history and powerful powerful knowledge in that and us being shaping the narrative of what students are learning about, and you know the real importance of having world history within your history curriculum because the truth is when you look at kind of year seven and um, and, and year eight and you know England as a kind of medieval kingdom at that time was fairly insignificant in, in world politics. Um, so the Normans had a great deal of influence across the world, but um, you know, to, to miss out things like the Ottomans or the Mughal Empire and things like that is just doing a massive disservice to our students. It's not really teaching them an accurate version of what history was actually like at the time. Um, so what's, what's so important to make sure it's broad enough to include that kind of world history. So this, so essentially, um, so, so Tom Sheraton wrote a really interesting um, article on uh, a knowledge-rich curriculum, um, which um, obviously we talk about a lot in education now. And um, kind of to summarise kind of four key points that we derive from that to help kind of think about what we're going to do with our curriculum at three or four years ago. Uh, these points here, so so knowledge providing a driving underpinning philosophy. So this idea that um, we, there, there is like key knowledge we want students to remember. We believe that by remembering and knowing more knowledge, um, it's going to make it easier for students to digest and understand key concepts. Uh, it's going to make it easier for them to acquire new knowledge and make links to other parts of the topics and courses we teach. Um, number two, knowledge content is specified in detail. So if we're teaching them about the Normans, for example, what is it exactly that we want them to remember? What is it exactly that we want them to know? So we're not having students kind of encounter uh, history and events. We, you know, we are teaching them specifically what we want them to know. And, that, and a lot of that stems from us as educators and teachers having a really clear idea of what we actually want students to know and remember by the end of each topic and how we're going to thread that in through the rest of the year to make sure they remember it. Which links to number three, which is this idea that we are, you know, we're teaching them knowledge to remember. You know, what, what would be the point 
I mean, I'm sure there would be a point, <laughs> but maybe it wouldn't be as great a point. If a student went through year, year seven, you know, encountered a series of topics, but they were never really um, assessed or reviewed on that knowledge again, and they, you know, they lost a lot of that knowledge, then, you know, perhaps they would have picked up um, some, some disciplinary skills, which you can use later on, but really it's, um, it's a bit of a waste opportunity. And then finally, it's like that knowledge is sequenced and mapped deliberately and coherently. So there's loads, so many opportunities within curriculum for history to make sure that if you teach topics in, in the kind of the right order and in the right way, um, you can really kind of scaffold different topics for students because they'll be building on existing knowledge from other topics. Um, and something that I think we do quite nicely, which I would find difficult. <laughs> so for instance, when we do year seven history, we um, do look at Islamic empire. Um, we do look at the Norman conquests. Um, and one of, one of the kind of links between that is, and we kind of start the Normans with this, um, to link the topics together, is um, one of the Saxon kings in Mercia, um, he was using from excavation from an archeological dig, I had all these gold coins buried with him and they all had these Islamic inscriptions on them. And um, the reason they had Islamic inscriptions on them, they were kind of copies of the Abbasid dynasty because that was kind of seen as the most important currency at the time. And so you had kind of um, Anglo-Saxon kings imitating um, Islamic coins to try to kind of be get better deals and, and trade deals with, with Europe, which shows the influence Islamic Kamara had um, across the world. Great. So this is our curriculum today. Um, as you can see, it's uh, mapped out uh, from year seven to year nine, where they start their GCSE topic midway through year nine, but then we then go back to key stage three. Uh, and all of this is purposeful. So again, if you're um, at home watching this, uh, please pause now and just think about those two questions, um, and then we will discuss it in just a moment. Okay, great. So we're going to start off with year seven then. So uh, we've got the why did African uh, king West Africa become so globalized in the medieval period? Now we've done that at the end of uh, summer two in year seven to sequence it before the what was the British Empire. It's quite easy, I guess, to have the idea that Britain went there and um, sort of colon well, it colonized, but it brought civilization and it, it went to these backwards people and it, it taught them how to how to be humane. But we know that that's not quite true, despite that being a belief from sort of people like Cecil Rhodes and whatnot. It's, you know, West Africa was a globalized country. It was a it was a beautiful country. It was rich. It was powerful. So it, you, we need to have the sort of understanding here from um, and the basis of a basic understanding that actually when the British Empire went there, um, that we don't promote these misconceptions. Uh, and that's why we've placed the West African Kingdoms uh, unit before the British Empire unit. Yes, um, and within that, we look at is it Mali, isn't it, is, is, the, is the predominant African kingdom and, and Mansa Musa. Um, so you can see that we also do something similar with um, the Mughals at the start of year eight, um, where we focus on the Mughal Empire and look at what um, you know, the Indian subcontinent was like before the British took over for the same reasons as what um, Samir described earlier on. And, um, you know, it's quite shocking because it's something that I wasn't really familiar with as a historian before we started teaching it. And I remember one of the first lessons we posed, one of the questions we posed to the students is, um, God, I'm going to get a year wrong, but something like, um, who was the rich, what was the richest kind of area um, in, in the world or empire in the world kind of in the 1700s, um, early 1700s? Um, and I think, um, I think Indian subcontinent or Mughal Empire accounted for something almost like a third of the um, exports across the world. And was one of the most, certainly one of the most powerful empires in the world. And people always, the students included, shocked by that. Um, which is quite interesting. And it, and it shows what's such an important misconception to confront this idea that the British went there and there was nothing and uh, kind of build it up from, from, from nothing, which is not true. Um, I think I might have just taken your speaking part there, didn't I? No, no, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. <laughs> no, um, on the what was British Empire, you know, we, we've done sort of um, a, di a different scope. It's, it's looking at how different people experience empire. So uh, we look at um, how Britain uh, was able to succeed in getting an empire in India, but then uh, especially with the partition unit. So um, how did people experience partition, which is sort of the second half of that British empire unit, um, looks at the people's experiences. Uh, the final one, which I'll touch on before Henry talks about year nine, is just 
how did the platinum British experience change over time? Again, this was just a really important one to to highlight um, that uh, instead of rights being given, um, black people in this country have actually fought for their rights and um, been successful in in gaining their rights in Britain. It was also important to show, um, you know, and uh, overcome that misconception that black people only arrived in Britain during the Windrush period. Um, using David Olasuga's book, mm-hmm. you see that actually you know, they've been here since the, the Roman times. So it was really important to just highlight these these issues because I think a lot of adults have these same misconceptions. And, you know, when we were doing this research, it was it was enlightening to us. So it's really important that we're doing that now for, for our students too. Mm. So something else which we, we is a very recent change um, is in the United. So we, we have got a, a, you know, a three-year GCSE course at Shawnee High School for Boys, which works for our students as much as we'd love to have a free year history. Um, it's what's best for us in our context. But one thing we've been working on over the last couple of years is to make sure that they don't start the GCSEs immediately in the And we do some extra, some kind of broadening content to give them a broader experience of the history curriculum. And um, what we found was anyway, that when we started teaching Germany for AQA history, which is our first unit of work, um, because we didn't have an opportunity to look at the Russian revolution and communism within key stage three, we found ourselves teaching it fine, I think, um, but quite often having to stop and, and teach new things, which I guess you would consider to be hinterland knowledge, but really was kind of crucial to them understanding the course content. So when you're looking at socialism, when you're looking at autocracy um, and communism, Stalin, it, you know, the Russian, it was kind of really important information that they needed to know, but they didn't know. So we changed it around and instead in year nine, we actually, we teach them about um, the collapse of the Tsar from 1915 um, and the USSR becoming communist and the experience of, of people in communism in the USSR. And um, as well as kind of enriching their experience of history, it just helped us to teach the German unit so much, you know, it was so much more, more fluid because they already now have a firm understanding of what communism is and what it looks like in a country, why it might be appealing to German working class people. Um, they already understand what you know, kind of autocracy is and what that looks like in government. Um, yeah, and it's it's been it's been massively beneficial for for us and for the students as well as obviously you know broadening the curriculum is actually helping them to grasp new knowledge much more effectively. Yeah, that's great. And I think, again, what, what Henry's touching on there is that whole idea of using that same concept, you know, the, that disciplinary knowledge and uh, bringing it into different scenarios. Ashby touched on that same idea of in, in an English lesson, she, um, uh, the idea of a hero, but then use the example, uh, sorry, the Aristotle's uh, idea of a hero, um, but then look at Frankenstein, Romeo and Juliet. Um, and so you sort of showing the same idea of a hero well the concept of a hero in different circumstances and that's hopefully what you can see we're, we're doing here too um great so again just touching on that um and ashby i know we've referred to it a couple of times already so that that creation of curriculum is called to the ongoing history of human endeavor and the conversation around this should be ongoing questions of truth interpretations of values are democratized and the defense against deceit and totalitarianism is offered do you want to explain that one um <laughs> sure <laughs> <laughs> so uh i think um what we're looking at there is i think really there are kind of narratives that are set up in history. Um, and I think Samir mentioned something else earlier on about history being written by the victors and, and kind of providing narratives of truth. And I think what's really important is that, you know, there's a difference between when we're teaching students about, we're teaching them facts, um, but we're also teaching them to, I guess, challenge interpretations and form their own opinions based on the facts that we're teaching them. But I suppose it's more than that, isn't it? Because you know, we're not just teaching students facts because we could be quite selective about the facts that we choose to teach them and that, that could actually create a narrative for them. So that's why it's so important to have this really broad curriculum, a broad range of knowledge, because if you leave some of the story out or some of the picture out, then of course they're going to come up with these narratives. So, you know, we've really, we, we've got a really vital part in, in, in making sure that students, um, you know, do think deeply about things and do have access to a broad range of knowledge to make the best informed decisions they can. Um, so, and, 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 you know, with, with that, you know, so our own subjects expertise is so important because like Samir alluded to earlier on as well, it's lots, lots of things that we didn't know when we kind of set out learning about these things. 
and um, and we need to be given time um, to, to know these things because it really is important. Yeah, I, and I think the whole idea of that post-truth world now, and the idea that what history can offer us is, um, you know, the the analysis and looking at source and looking at okay, where is it coming from, and to make, coming to our own conclusion rather than. Um, sort of taking things all at face value and that's the whole importance of interpretation and source analysis and that's why when you saw uh, off call last year and the year before when uh, COVID reduced our exams by 25% we saw that the source paper remained because sources are just so important in their analysis of provenance and everything. Great so this is these are our curriculum maps now so these are curriculum maps, uh, and these are quite deliberately, uh, well, pretty to look at. They're, they're uh, quite visible. The faces are visible. Uh, the key themes are on there too. Um, and these are this is all deliberate, as I, as I said. So the reason for this, if they're displayed in the classrooms, they're displayed in the corridors, the certificates that go home to the students after each half term for those sort of best performing and best engaging students. And um, they... They all have these faces on. And the reason for that is so our parents and our students know that this is a school which will show a diverse um, uh, and inclusive history. So as you can see, we've got sort of the Islamic empires uh, beginning in year seven and you go up uh, to the uh, Normans and Anglo-Saxons. You go up to the medieval queens and how powerful they were to make sure that students know that um, that the misconceptions just around women in the medieval period aren't always true. Um, the church and the Tudors, so you look at who changed the church the most uh, in the Tudor period. Um, and then you look at sort of the power and, uh, power and the people, which is the GCSE unit, um, but we've condensed it into a Kise 3 unit. And then we've got uh, the West African Kingdoms unit I, I mentioned. So again, a really vast range and uh, diverse uh, range of people and faces. Um, I won't touch on all of these uh, for now, but as you can work your way up and sort of uh, zoom in as well, you can see what year eight and year nine does um, to make all students feel included in, in the history. Uh, the, this is the next part of uh, what we're doing. Um, do you want to touch on why we do this? Yes, yeah, so I think kind of based on what we said to begin with, when, when we looked at uh, Christian Council's, um, you know, curriculum, which we showed you at the beginning, um, we looked at our own curriculum, you know, three or four years ago, and we wanted to focus on some certain things to really improve it. So one of those things was uh, clearly from what we showed you in the last slides, the, you know, the sequencing of knowledge uh, and being more selective about the topics and content that we choose, chose to teach, um, which we've kind of talked through now. Uh, and the second thing, is uh, modeling and deliberate practice. So really thinking carefully about what knowledge we're teaching and, and how we're teaching it. That's in relation to both substantive and disciplinary knowledge. Um, also retrieval practice to make sure it's sequenced well, to make sure we'll give the students the best possible chance of remembering key knowledge. Um, yeah, so those kind of three main things that we really focused on improving across the curriculum. Great, so this is what we use in one of our British uh, Empire unit lessons, so on partition. And as you can see, um, a diverse uh, sort of uh, historical scholarship, so uh, from the book Borders and Boundaries, um, and just making the students engage in um, sort of female history, but female historians too. And then we can see the deliberate practice so that I do, we do, you do, um, the modeling uh, of it. So. We've got that as one example. Um, so what we're going to go on to next is retrieval and how we uh, implement retrieval into our history. Yeah, so this is something you should probably even most of you be familiar with, which is Willingham's uh, memory model, sort of mind map. Um, and so we really thought hard about this and also um, yeah, uh, Ebbinghouse, Ebbinghouse's learning uh, memory uh, loss curve and really try to think hard about this research and implement it into our own practice. So in terms of the environment, it was kind of really important to us that um, students are in a controlled environment when they are doing retrieval. So, you know, we insist on it being independent. Um, occasionally within lessons, we'll give them opportunities to do paired discussion. But really, if you're trying to remember something um, to strengthen that memory, it needs to come from you independently. Um, and also, obviously, with trying to embed it in students' long-term memory, giving them opportunities, planning for opportunities for them to review the knowledge 
in a meaningful way. So there's a difference between re-exposure to knowledge and retrieval. So we don't want, really want them just um, kind of encountering that knowledge again, two or three weeks later. We want them thinking hard about it and trying to remember key facts and knowledge that we want that we've taught them. And we know that the more that we do that, the easier it is for the students to then remember that knowledge. And then when it comes down to their disciplinary knowledge, when they do it, when they're writing or analyzing sources or writing essay answers, you know, they're going to find that much easier when they've, when they've got that kind of foundation of knowledge there before they start applying it. So we've got a, num a number of methods we've been working over the years, which we're just going to talk to you about now in terms of how effective they are. Yeah, so the quizzes we set, uh, some we set uh, daily, so after each lesson, some are set weekly, uh, depending sort of on the uh, on the breadth of it. So uh, this is just uh, all our homework, it sees uh, retrieval practice, uh, students like doing it, it can be done in sort of five to ten minutes. Um, and it's quite a nice, easy win. We ask school teachers to give achievement points out though, for those who've, who've engaged well with the, the homework each week. So quite a nice, easy win for students because they know they're going to get achievement points if they if they do well on these quiz. And they're always just on things in which they, they've learned in class. So something in which if you've paid attention in class, you've engaged well in the lesson, you should be doing well in this. Um, so the retrieval practice booklets. Now these work a little bit differently. Um, so essentially this is like a knowledge dump so as you can see the three titles here that takes up three lessons so students would have around 12 minutes to complete this um, and you have word prompts at the bottom here of course and you also have picture prompts uh, to help the students now after 12 minutes what we do is uh, stop the students ask them to get a different color pen we use green here and then what I do is have uh, the answer booklet out in front of me and I'd be asking different students um, to try and pull out that knowledge from them. So say they may not have got everything down. So I'd ask them a question on Hippocrates. I'd ask them a question about uh, and then we'd finish Hippocrates, go on to Galen and go on to cause and treatment. So I'd say they they've all missed out, maybe or, you know, it, as it's low stakes, I'm not actually. Uh, completely checking. I'm going around seeing how much they've written, but you know, I'm not. I'm not saying, oh, you know, you you could have done better because this this is about keeping it low stakes. You're not taking a record of how well they've done. You're not keeping a record. Oh, you filled in a whole page. Well done. Um, but cause and treatments. I'd say, uh, student X. Um, what is the, what do they think caused um, a disease in the medieval age? Let's think. Uh, what's the what's the medieval word uh, for, for smell and they'd say oh, miasma so but you're pulling out that knowledge like that so as you can see we then pull up all the answers and then we go through anything they've missed um, going back then so after they've done all of the retrievals the first time round with the picture prompts and the word prompts they then go to the second version in which uh, doesn't have any uh, word or uh, picture prompts and, and then do it a second time we actually do that three times before the students uh, complete the booklets to make sure that they do have fully embedded that knowledge. And we space it out uh, to make sure we give it enough time for the child to forget it. And it's the same with what we've got here. So these, um, so we found sometimes that uh, this style of retrieval um, knowledge dump um, was sometimes a little bit overwhelming for some students. So we wanted to try to create another one, uh, which is helpful for teachers as well. So we kind of like, um, we kind of, focused on what was the most important knowledge again that we want students to remember and we condensed it into these big quizzes um, and so every topic we, we created like a 50 question quiz of the most important things they should really understand um, and this is for year seven year eight and, and GCSE uh, so just for, as, for example for the German topic on Kaiser which is very content heavy we have um, six 50 question quizzes um, which we would say that if you kind of know most of the answers to those questions and then you know, you've got a pretty good understanding of, of that German unit. That's very simple. Um, you know, we would give them the 50 question quiz and we'd probably give them between uh, 15 and 20 minutes to answer as many of the questions as they can. Uh, following that, you, you, you can then use allow them to work in pairs to fill in the answers they got weren't sure about in green pen. Uh, and then you can still you still need to have that whole class discussion because it might be that the student next to them has got it wrong and they're telling them the wrong answer and they think it's the right answer. Um, or you can simply get them to do it independently and then you can then go through it as a class and, and green pen the answers. So by green pen, I mean, correct it with a different color pen so you can see where the, where the gaps in knowledge are. 
Um, but obviously doing it once wouldn't be enough, as Samir said, and, and from what we showed you earlier with the research. So it would need to then be repeated. Um, and we've got that structure within our curriculum. So it might be that it's two weeks later, they do the same quiz. Um, and, and, and then across the year, it's kind of staged in. So there's plenty of opportunity for them to review that knowledge. Great. And just the last one, we're going to touch on these multiple choice question booklets. Again, just something in which we created um, for all the GCSE topics and we move towards making them for Key Stage 3 as well. Nice, easy wins for the students uh, to build up their confidence. Um, this would just what the inside of the booklet looks like. So you've got that first page, obviously the title page. The second page just tells the students how they can also use it self-testing or verbal testing and then keeping a record, which you can see on that last slide. Um, so there's 20, 20 attempts, I, um, you know, just for the most keen students, I very much doubt they'll, they'll do it 20 times. Um, and then each question booklet. So you've got the questions and then you've got the answers here. So again, just that, just making a difference for those students who are pushing from a three to a four or a four to a five and five to a seven, et cetera, et cetera. It really helps them just push on um, and try to remember those key dates, figures, uh, people, um, et cetera. Great. So, so that's kind of covers a lot of things we want to talk to you about in terms of the change we made to our curriculum. So retrieval, sequence acknowledging, uh, knowledge, more diversity, um, and also deliberate practice. And Ms. Swim mentioned that I do, we do, you do method, which we use a lot for modeling for the students. Um, and to kind of, um, I suppose, consolidate this, we've been working on creating work booklets, which I know I, I've seen a few, a few schools do for history and I've always been quite, quite jealous and envious of, uh, of, of the work that they're doing that. So we have made our, some of our own booklets. And um, these are the benefits so far, which I'm gonna show you one example in a moment. Um, so it's been kind of collaborative and consistent approach towards teaching specific content. So we, we're saying that we want students to know these things. And so by making these, these booklets collaboratively, we can really plan and sequence and make sure that the students are learning and given, being given opportunities to remember and retrieve knowledge. Um, it centralizes all of the assessments and the visual practice. It's all kind of mapped out and planned within these booklets, booklets which matches the, um, the schemes of work. All the modeling and deliberate practice is embedded to support teachers and students. Um, all the assessment time and feedback, and that's all built into the booklet. And I think it's one of those things where by centralizing it, it's minimizing workload for staff. Uh, and it does support non-specialists. And I know lots of people do have non-specialist teaching with the departments. And of course, you know, when staff do inevitably move on, um, you, you then get new staff coming in. And it might be that they've not taught a lot of these topics before and find it difficult, but the booklet just makes it that much more easier for them to adapt to it and develop quickly. Um, we also do for each lesson include space where if the teacher wanted to teach their own lesson, then there's space for them to do that. Obviously, it still needs to be within the context of, you know, the unit of work we're trying to teach and the assessment points we're trying to, to reach. Um, because although we, we kind of see the benefits of it, um, you know, quite understandably, some st staff might feel like, um, you know, it's been, it's been dictated to them and they like the freedom to plan their own lessons. And we're pretty, pretty completely supportive of that. But so far, um, I would say that every member of staff likes using them and wants to use them and wants to bring it to more units of work. So here's an example from year eight, um, which is the Mughals. And there's two booklets. And so we look at six emperors and we're looking at significance um, and which emperor is most significant. So this would be, this is the student booklet, but there's also a, a PowerPoint that slides, which um, teachers have got access to, which you've got a little bit more information, obviously, because the slides are gonna be a little bit different from the booklet. Um, yeah, so um, inquiry question on the front, um, small knowledge organizer, some keywords, some, some tier three vocabulary, uh, and then quite, and then yeah, look, knowledge organizer carrying on, because we've got all of each of the emperors there. Um, and then really importantly, looking at um, significance, because that's, that's a quite key concept for the topic. So really thinking about what significance is. I did find this from somebody on Twitter and I can't remember for the life of me who it was. So I apologize that I can't give credit for it, but, uh, but it wasn't my idea and it is really, really good. Um, so, um, and then you've got lesson by lesson. So each lesson starts with um, uh, low, low, st low stakes or retrieval activity. Obviously it's the first lesson, so we're looking at the Indian subcontinent. Um, and yes, you've got video clip and the questions, all the readings embedded in there, which they, they could use to answer the next questions. Um, and then lesson two, and again, the retrieval built in from the previous lesson um, and so on and so forth. So what I think we, we found with this is 
we can really think carefully about how we structure our curriculum and how the booklets reflect that. And so this is the first example of the assessment. So you've got a multiple choice quiz built in there. And we've got our writing. Uh, and we call it writing practice because we're not necessarily really kind of in year eight and year seven or, or at various points we're, you know, we're, we're modeling for them. And then they're, so, so, so it's kind of independent practice mixed in with teacher support. Um, so this is an example of that where we would do the first paragraph with them uh, and then they do the next paragraph themselves. Um, yeah, great. Um, so we identified through sort of where we were last year that there were, were further steps that we need to take. Uh, we know that we need to diversify the historical scholarship used. We were often using, um, well, men, uh, mostly white men, but men generally, um, using scholars explicitly in lessons. Um, we knew that we need to diversify, diversify generally, and we still know that's a journey we still need to go on in terms of LGBT history, uh, disabled history. Um, so it's important that we, we take that further. We could even probably implement more female history, although we are making great inroads there. Um, and then implementing I do, we do, you do into lessons. And this is just one example of how we've updated one unit of work this year in terms of in trying to um, implement these things. So being completely self-reflective all the time. So this was just one lesson. So um, our World War One unit of uh, forgotten stories, and it's looking at, again, um, implementing uh, sort of more sources. And as you can see, there's always got uh, the, uh, the provenance of the source. Uh, the key words, as you saw in the curriculum map at the very start, so you've got their imperialism, empire, war, decolonization. Um, students will are then tested on this at the end of the year, the definitions of these words. And that, that slide is in every single lesson at year eight. Um, and then what's been changed this year is, is this sort of slide. So we've implemented a, a slide on the, histor um, the scholar where we've got this uh, lesson or create this lesson from. So this is obviously Emily Mayhew and the, on the stretcher bearers. We've got the text, the extract, uh, and then we've got some questions. Finishing that uh, and how the lesson ends is an I do, we do, you do. So as you can see, the source work, the first one is done by the teacher and then the different source is done by the students. So testing the, the skills, seeing if they can look at what we've done and then whether they can input it themselves and then just show you black soldiers, so again, from two different authors, David Aldersugas, Black and British and the World's War, so as Stephen Bourne's uh, Black Poppies, uh, the extract, the questions, and the I do, we do, you do. Third example, uh, East Asians, and something which I wasn't too aware, aware of. I know our RMP in Luton, so Sarah Nor um, Owen, she very much promotes this and has been a very much uh, advocate of uh, acknowledging the East Asian contribution to World War One. Um, and I was found her, her sort of readings and postings really useful when I was making this lesson. But again, David Olasuga's The World's War was used. Um, the extract. Uh, the extract again. Uh, another source. The extract. Uh, and the questions. And then the um, I do, we do, you do again. Uh, and then finally, life of women during World War One. Again, just trying to implement a more female history into um, the curriculum. So this, I found this book absolutely fascinating. Um, story I wasn't aware of, uh, Endor Street by Wendell Wendy Moore. Uh, two, two women. Again, this is our sort of first opportunity in implementing more LGBT history. Although we want to do more through sort of the ID we do. Sorry, the meanwhile elsewhere's. Um, which is sort of the next steps, really. Um, so again, Wendy Moore, the extract, the questions, and the um, I do, we do, you do. Uh, I think a, a quick and easy question, as maybe you're looking at this, is um, don't students find this boring? Um, it's, it's quite samey, samey. All I'd say to that is what I loved when I was at school, and I'm sure it'd probably be the same for you, is you love the subjects you were good at, um, look, I'm not the best footballer in the world, um, but <laughs> don't shake your head, but I love PE, um, because, you know, I was, I was okay in it, in, in sort of the context of my secondary school experience, but, and I loved history because I was good at it. Students are good at, uh, sorry, love what they're good at and they're good at what they love. So if we can start implementing sort of a diverse history and start showing students that, uh, they can be good at history, but by following these methods, then, then they will love 
uh, the whole idea and that the the format of the lessons is something to keep a certain structure and routine especially in our context it may not work in yours that it really helps our students um so henry's just going to touch on sort of how this what an slt can do for and what the slt have done here for uh, to help us yeah so so in our in our school we have a uh, black shoe priorities each year which um some stay the same and some change depending on the the priorities of the school but we find it helpful just to have kind of you know three or four things that we focus on as a whole school each year um and so you can see for for the previous year when we looked at this it was ritual practice but presentation cold calling explaining and modeling and by doing that um and really kind of promoting that whole school it does start from the top you you do get a joined up thinking and joined up approach to delivering on these priorities within all subjects within the school and i think the history department took a real lead on on, on some of these, particularly I'd say retrieval practice and explaining and modeling. Um, but yeah, and, and it allows kind of a common approach and, and students can then benefit from that and see that in each of the lessons they go to. Yeah, and I think what we're looking at when we're thinking about, you know, what an outstanding school might look like uh, and, and what they do well. Um, so you can, you can see for yourself there, but clearly curriculum is a big focus for Ofsted now and in, and in regardless of Ofsted it should be a clear focus for us anyway because um, clearly it's important what we think about when we the diet of education we're providing the students that we we look after um, and so with that in mind I think it's important to see that curriculum is always evolving um, giving middle leaders giving department heads an opportunity to review and time to review and time to have the subject discourse with their teams is really important because it's not just for the department lead or middle leaders to know this. I think it's important for them to be taking a collaborative, a co-constructive approach to curriculum with their teams. Um, because actually just by doing that, you, you, you know, you're engaging in that subject discourse, which is so important. And just a uh, well, penultimate slide, really, is just the headline figures and uh, why we're speaking, I guess, from, from a place of um, hopefully expertise is sort of the journey we've uh, gone on. So from 2019, where uh, was the first year Henry and I uh, joined the school. So um, the the figures weren't great and it's sort of 50% um, pass rate, I think it is, yeah, nine to four. So you had 2.2% getting nines. And where we see now in the latest res results, we've got, um, you know, our nine to sevens have gone from 14.5% to 464 um, nine to fours are now just, you know, just reaching 84% and our progress data hitting one point positive of 1.52. But you can also see the key six three figures have massively changed. We're actually now seeing uh, uh, disadvantaged pupils outperforming non-disadvantaged, but also just an overwhelming shift to, to students doing well and engaging well in history. Um, we've talked about many things and I just, I just really want to promote that, uh, finally just that idea of a diverse history being really helpful to our students and maybe contexts like yours because and I think the one quote which really sums it up is this professor of history and history education at Kennesaw State University Kay Trail and she said if we only pay lip service to diversity in the curriculum if we alienate through ignorance or disenfranchise through our teaching if we ignore and remain silent through indifference or fear of causing disharmony then it should not surprise us when the history have not take what they have not been given and create historical nav narratives that clash with the ideals of democratic societies. Young people hold the future in their hands and the way they think about feel and think and feel about history is relevant to the present and probably significant in shaping futures. We can, if we are daring enough, teach a history in a way that will give them the tools to view the past, the present and the future through a variety of windows that will empower them. Ultimately, democratic societies can only be benefit from such a process. Okay, so I think we're just going to leave you with these key takeaways, which, uh, which you can uh, look at and read yourselves, but hopefully they make sense. And uh, if, you've, if you're still here, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you, you very much. It. Thank you.